a lot of what we do as a national charity, NBC, is is on a kind of macro scale influencing government policy. But it, there's loads we can be doing on a local level. I know everybody's always strapped for time and resources, but a big part of what we want to do with these talks is to give people the tools where possible to, um, yeah, to self-actualize and do a bit of DIY work, DIY work, at least, you know, know the way around the systems. So this is a really excellent opportunity to do that because Martin is um, one of the UK's leading expert advocates for men's health uh, with a vast experience in campaigning, both at the local and national level. Uh, men's Health Forum is the country's foremost men's health advocacy charity. Uh, through advice, research and campaigning, the charity aims to reduce the tra tragic deaths of men and boys who simply die too young because of preventable health problems. Men MHF works across a number of health and related issues, including cancer, workplace health, mental health and access to services. And Martin is also a Hampshire County Councillor and as of last week was elected leader of Winchester City Council. Really? So... There is literally no one better to talk about how to influence a council than Martin right here. Um, uh, so I'm really looking forward to this. I've been, you know, wanting to get this talk um, on on the schedule for ages. I'm really, really excited about this one. And we're going to record it and send it around because, again, this will be a resource for people to use after. So please share and I'll be sharing it around quickly before handing over to Martin. I think probably actually everybody, apart, maybe, maybe not. You may not be familiar, Elvira. Um, uh, we are, Men's Health Forum and NBC, along with uh, a coalition of other leading men's health practitioners and charities are leading the campaign for a national men's health charity, um, which- Strategy. Strategy, sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Strategy, thank you, Martin. That's what I meant. Yeah, so I would encourage um, everybody to take a look, if they haven't seen it already, in the chat box and sign up to it, which is, yeah, I'm just sharing it. Brilliant. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Martin. Uh, and thank you, Dan. And uh, thank you for the chance to come along here today and um, uh, see everybody and uh, quickly run through um, some thoughts on how to influence local government. Um, <clears throat> so you've touched on my background. So I've been a city councillor uh, since 2012, a county councillor since 2013. I realised not every uh, area has that divide between district councils and county councils, but I'll touch on, you know, um, other forms of council as well. Um, at the county council, I've specialised, uh, I specialised in health and adult services between 2013 and 2017 and then since 2017 the environment transport and economy um, partly because I actually saw that those also have a huge influence on on people's health and well-being um, how you get around how the economy is doing other such things um, uh, is a very important aspect in in healthy living and healthy life um, at the city council I was in opposition between 2012 and 2019 since 2019, I've been a cabinet member and I'll kind of try and talk through roughly how councils work or most councils work. There is a range of models and I probably need to put in some disclaimer about your council is almost certainly different to what I'm going to say. And then as of, yeah, as you as you mentioned, as of last week, I'm leader of Winchester City Council uh, and I've been chief executive of the Men's Health Forum since 2013. A little bit about the Men's Health Forum, charity, I mean, you introduced me very well, but uh, to improve the health of men and boys is what we're about. We work in England, Scotland and Wales. In Northern Ireland, um, men's health issues mainly are handled by Men's Health Forum in Ireland. Uh, we were founded in 1995 by the Royal College of Nursing. Uh, and we work with a range of other charities, uh, you know, alongside our um, friends and colleagues in the Men and Boys Coalition, academics, employers, the NHS, the wider health system, of course, directly with men. Uh, even today, one man in five is dying before the age of 65, doesn't make it to retirement, which when you actually stop and think about the human consequences of that is genuinely really shocking. And pandemic, uh, sorry, and um, we've also just seen for the first time in many years, a decline in, um, in men's life expectancy. Um, th there was a long period of time, particularly because of improvements in cardiovascular health, 
um, where the rim where life expectancy was growing uh, and it's stabilized both for men and for women and because of COVID has actually declined for men in the last year or so. Uh, what we do, we do research and policy, good practice, we work with others and we gauge directly with men. Um, and as you mentioned, we campaign on various issues and this uh, coming up shortly in June, we're going to be pushing Men's Health Week, um, particularly around the idea that the health system actually stopped engaging with men uh, relatively, relatively even compared to women during the pandemic. And so there's a whole bunch of men out there whose um, um, heart conditions aren't known about and aren't controlled, uh, who have undiagnosed prostate cancer. And there's a whole bunch of things that the health system needs to do to re-engage with those men um, and, and help men engage, uh, get on top of their health. Anyway, I want to talk about local government and health. And um, actually the year before, this is a sort of a bit of a, a journey, but the year before I joined the Men's Health Forum, um, an interesting paper was produced by Dave Winskill and some backbench councillors in Haringey on men's health, uh, a scrutiny review. Now, this is probably the moment where I need to talk about how councils work. Um, so, as a sort of general, the normal model that you have in running a council is the so-called leader and strong leader and cabinet model. Um, so what happens at councils is you elect your local councillors area by area, either a proportion every year or every four years. They then pick somebody as leader, which is normally from the majority group of the council. They appoint a cabinet. Uh, which gets endorsed by the council. And the day-to-day -day operating of the council is done by the leader and cabinet. So there is, but in order to stop them all going mad and charging off and doing random things, there is a process called scrutiny. So a decision that gets taken by a council uh, goes through what's called the scrutiny process. You decide so this is made up of opposition and backbench councillors. So cabinet members, the people who are notionally running the council, aren't allowed to be on scrutiny by law. So this is a kind of separate group of people who look at what the council is doing. And one of the things that they can do is explore new areas of policy um, and and sort of look at an issue and say, this is something the council should think about. This is, this is what it should be doing. Um, and the reason I'm starting with it is that actually, if you look at some of the initiatives that have had the biggest impact in men's health in local government, they all started with scrutiny in some cases, in most cases, not all, but in, in most cases, they seem to have started with scrutiny. So Haringey, uh, started with a scrutiny review done by a then councillor, Dave Winskill. Um, uh, we then responded to that as an organisation by working with the Centre for Public Scrutiny on a guide to questions to ask about men's health. Um, and that then led to uh, or contributed to the scrutiny inquiry in Leeds. So we've heard a lot about men's health in Leeds and the great initiatives and men's health and a lot that started in scrutiny. It didn't start with the cabinet saying we're going to do this and the, the, the official body of the council. It started with um, this, this backbench and opposition group. Now, the rules normally mean that the majority group has control over the scrutiny committee <laughs> even they may not have the chair and there's various other stuff i won't get into so again you it it's not something necessarily that opposition people can get to go on their on their own but it's a very interesting way of getting quite wide based change um by, by in a fairly low stakes way because it's not setting the policy it's saying this is what the policy could be and the two that we have here that came out of and directly referenced our report um, 
were the scrutiny inquiry in Leeds. Now, obviously, it, it helped in Leeds having a centre for men's health in Leeds uh, that, that did a lot of work on the report um, and Camden. And so what happened in both those cases is that the various, this scrutiny committee, and sometimes there's more than one, I don't want to get too complicated about it. Sometimes there'll be a specific health scrutiny committee and in other places there might just be one scrutiny committee. Um, commission some work through council staff or officers, as, of, as insiders often call them, to do a piece of work to, with councillors to look at men's health um, in Leeds, in Camden, and then report back to the council for action. And in all of those cases, to the best of my knowledge, certainly in the case of Leeds, certainly in the case of Haringey, it led to direct action and programmes coming out of that. So that was that's one sort of proven model that has worked. <clears throat> and we can talk about how you might trigger that as an outside organisation as well. Um, a second model that we used, which is a bit more arm's length and suitable probably more for a kind of national body, uh, which was again quite successful and led to quite a lot of local authorities starting and strengthening their men's health programs was a kind of double whammy that we did, I think it was about 2014 or 15, where we sent freedom of information requests asking what is the gender split on your health services? Because we suspected in many cases they didn't know and when they found out, they would be shocked by the result. And that is indeed what happened. So that the asking of the FOI, followed by mailing this guide to all the directors of public health, led to several local authorities. And, and we were supporting this. You can see it was supported by you know, Public Health England, RIP, who was also sending it out via their contacts. Um, but... The combination of that led to a significant number of local authorities gearing up what they were doing with men, starting new men's weight loss programs. And so that, that was one that's purely arm's length, the freedom of information request, which sometimes, because it reveals something, gives you information that either triggers action automatically within the council or gives you a leverage to, to put pressure on a council. And then the third one is one, a council that I'm actually on. And that was where you had a friendly councillor to the issue, in this case, me, um, who was sending in questions about how are they doing on men's health? What was the gender split of their uh, NHS health check programme? Other such things. I would stress I was always very clear to make my interests clear so that they knew. And it wasn't secret that I worked for the the Men's Health Forum, and also talking to the cabinet member responsible for public health and getting them on board. And they actually ended up making a bid to the EU, remember them, uh, and getting a large kind of joint programme together, which led to the setting up of men's activity network and training in men's health champions and a whole wide range of activity on men. And that was all about having a friendly councillor on board. Ultimately, that was the big driver who was an insider working the system. Um, so probably should have had this slide slightly early. What are councils? What do they do? Um, in theory, councils, they have what's called a general power of competence. They're allowed to do whatever they, they can, uh, but they are all, they're limited in terms of their resources. They're democratic and deliberative organizations. So, you know, they are the overall policy, the direction um, is set by councillors. Um, they work with council officers to, who, whose job is to deliver uh, policy. Um, there are, the job of councillors is to set policy. It is not to micromanage because you could quite quickly run into difficulties if you had councillors deciding, you know, on a on a discretionary basis, whose house would be built or other such things, and who would get planning permission. So there's, there's bits of what councils do that are called quasi-judicial, where councillors are taking decisions, but they're not 
you know, they are required to follow rules in terms of how they take decisions. But the general thing is that councillors set the policy, say, this is what we're going to do. These are our priorities. This is the budget. Uh, the cabinet normally lead on that and the leader and cabinet lead on that. And then the officers then go out and execute it. Um, if you're in a two tier area, and I think everybody here isn't, so this is of fairly theoretical interest, uh, district councils do council housing, housing benefit, parking, recycling, collections, because in two tier areas, one authority collects, the other disposes, which is a bit random, um, planning and building, parks, playgrounds, leisure facilities, council tax collection, that sort of rough overview of what districts do. Counties do more of the stuff that men's health campaigners might be interested in or men's uh, people wanting greater focus on men's issues might be interested in. They do uh, schools, although they are limited in, much more limited in how much they can influence what schools do uh, than used to be the case sort of 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, public health, um, social services for adults and children, um, roads, cycleways, pavements, rubbish and cycling, recycling disposal, planning for minerals, energy and waste disposal. It's very exciting. Where are you going to put your tips and things? Uh, flooding is an area of great interest to many people. Uh, buses, community transport. Some local authorities are uh, passenger transport, executive authorities, libraries, and then unitaries in other areas. Broadly, you have a unitary that does both of those, although you also have the complexities of mayoral systems and other such things. And at that point, you know, life gets a bit too complicated to explain. Um, uh, and then how to, how to influence them. I don't want to go on too long on this because I suspect the discussion may be more useful. Um, ultimately, if you're going to get action, you are going to need to get the ruling administration to support what you're doing. Um, you do have the option in finely balanced councils where there is a prospect of change that you could sort of bet on the opposition and hope that they take control and do what you want to do if you think you have an issue that will help them win the election. Uh, but, but generally, you will want to have a good relationship with both sides because the risk is if you don't, that projects start and stop. And in practice, it's quite achievable to have a good relationship with the various different sides within, um, within a council. Um, the obvious first step if you want to influence a council is contact your councillor or contact a councillor. Um, because generally, they quite like to hear, I mean, there are obviously exceptions, but they quite like to hear for, from residents and local organizations otherwise you know be a bit of a rubbish job to be doing if you didn't like that um, and if you if you have one that's experienced and knows their way around they will have a lot of contacts and relationships that can help you get the council to change um, it is always possible to contact that the, the cabinet member there is a point which is you know work out the start point it, as in all types of influencing, is understand the organisation. Who's doing what? Who's the cabinet member responsible for the area that you're interested in? Who are the officers, if you can find that out? Uh, or the director? What are the policies that cover it? So there's a kind of background due diligence that you normally do if you're engaging with anybody. Um, but the cabinet member or portfolio holder, those are both names that are used for the same thing. Um, the director is normally the most senior officer responsible for a particular area or you contact the chief executive, but they will most certainly pass it on to someone else. Um, if you've got a service that you want councillors to understand, councillors generally like visiting services. They like going out to places and having their photo taken. Um, so if you have that as a something you can offer and something where they can go and meet real people and talk about their issues and other such things, that is a good good thing to do it will never be a problem inviting councillors to go and see things is generally never an issue because uh, they quite like to you know get out and see what's happening in their area there are other more formal things you can do so it this really does vary by council but there are ways in which you can do things in public um 
So you can, and this varies by council. So you can do what's called a deputation, where you say, I want to come and talk about X, and at a full council meeting, which would be in front of all the councillors, or at a specialist committee. So let's say health and adult services committee, particularly if there's an item in, on the agenda that you might want to talk about. And you can come along and you can make a presentation and you will have a certain period of time, five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever it happens to be, according to the council, where you can, um, you can make your case. Um, there are public questions um, in some councils, but not all. So that's where you have the opportunity just to ask a question and then the cabinet member will respond. And then there may be a follow up where you, you can do ask a supplementary question. So they'll, there are normally kind of rules about how you do this, but it can be a good way of getting an issue uh, on the agenda. Um, because there you are, the media are there, everybody's there, you can ask a question in public and, um, uh, and possibly get an issue on the table that way. Uh, Councillors can ask questions obviously as well. Um, and that's another tool that you can use. So that was the tool I used when I was a councillor to start getting a bit of attention on, on men's health issues. Um, councils are often running consultations. So, you know, particularly if you're a locally based organisation uh, and you have a good relationship there, it's worth watching out for consultations and, and responding to that. And there is a kind of legal duty to take those responses seriously. And generally, my experience is officers do. I mean, they don't just kind of ignore them. Uh, by law, all councils have to have a petition uh, facility. That that does need careful handling because they do have a minimum threshold that you need to hit. And I know that on men's issues, partly because I think we're still at the stage of needing to educate people more widely quite often on, on the scale of those issues, you may not get the numbers that you want in order to get the outcome that you want and then there's the extreme option obviously of running for election and ending up running a council so you know that's uh, that's the nuclear option uh, but hey I, I recommend it it's highly entertaining and then there's all kinds of the unofficial options you know the classic campaigning methods building a team getting the word out building a coalition of people of support events demonstrations uh, building your case activating people getting other people to write to councillors um, et cetera, et cetera, doing surveys on local issues to show what people might feel about a particular situation and all the, all the things of media activity that you can do. So photo opportunities, letters, press releases. Um, and I'll just finish with just some top tips that occurred to me, but there are probably a load more that will come up in conversation. Um, one is it really will help if you can find a friendly counsellor on your side. Now that doesn't help for national campaigns but if you're a local area you know you need you are going to make, get need to get to know who the cabinet members are you're going to need a relationship with them um, and certainly I know that as a as a councillor there are some organizations that are very active in making sure they know that I know who they are they invite me to their meetings and events and things like that and there's just they're, they're running that relationship so that when you come to who we're going to give grants to, who we're going to give money to, um, what priorities are we going to have? Those conversations have been had. You know, the relationship is there. So there is that. That that is a really important way into it. There's a thing here which is sort of going with the policy flow. It's really hard to get people to do 180 degree turns on policy. It's much easier to get them to do a kind of five degree adjustment uh, because. Politicians generally don't like doing 180 degree U-turns and they don't like, administrations generally don't like feeling like they've lost an argument. If they can frame it in a way where they've shown that they're listening to people, they'll kind of do that. But confrontation, you know, if the goal is to get action, unless it's a, a council where you're affected, you know, you will need these people to not sign checks, but you know, make decisions in your favour. So generally, nudging them in a direction, using the policies and priorities that they have in place is going to be more effective. So for example, you know, if I look at the area of health, all councils, 
more or less at the moment are very worried about health in areas of deprivation. So if you take that and that, you know, if you then say, no, no, don't do that, do men's health, you'll lose the argument. It just won't work. If you say, when you're doing your work on deprivation, think about the different needs of men and women, then you may get progress. You know, when you're thinking about, when you're running an obesity program amongst this group, think about the different needs of men and women, that, that will work much better than trying to trying to get them to kind of stop doing what they're doing um slightly depends on what the policy context and is are they in a moment where they want to reinvent everything you know that's also a kind of thing where you need to be contextually sensitive but for example there's a lot about inclusion and diversity at the moment um it's sort of appearing in a lot of council strategies on a much higher level than it did before so again tap into that look for the institution they might be setting any equality and diversity committee or other such thing and see if you can work with that uh, rather than trying to confront it and then there's always an interest obviously in any public health organization in in suicide and mental health generally and again that is an enabler for starting conversations and as said a five percent adjustment is much easier than a 180 degree u-turn and be helpful I mean, that would be, you know, if this, the thought would be, if you get confrontational, if it turns into a win-lose, well, you'll probably lose, is the answer. Because unless the council is, you know, going to get, you're, you're going to be able to set up a campaign that the council feels compelled to change, um, which does happen on some issues. Uh, so it's not impossible. Then it, it's just a harder journey. Um but it's one of those things where I think you need to be context sensitive. I think you'll be surprised how much you can get by working in a kind of positive, constructive, friendly way with your local council. Because I think what you'll find is, you know, particularly if you can frame it in terms of the outcomes that they're looking to do, there's a thing called a council strategy which, or community strategy, which a lot of councils have. And if you can be framing what you're doing in terms of what they've said they want to do as a priority, you know, I think there are real opportunities to make real progress. So probably if I stop there, I don't know if that's useful or if I've told you. That was absolutely uh, fascinating, Martin. Really, um, yeah, such deep, you know, really, yeah, really interesting. Um, and just so, such a practical, effective step-by-step you know, uh, explanation of how it works and what you can actually do, which is, I mean, regardless of the number of people on this particular talk, the real value is if we can have this sitting as a resource for people to check into, um, <laughs> it's, it's really valuable. So um, thank you very much. And for finding the time, considering everything well, else you've got. The here is a bit mad at the moment. So yeah, yeah. there's been a bit of a, there was a bit of a like, whoa, let's quickly write this presentation. <laughs> well, I mean. <laughs> Between yeah. meetings with yeah i mean it's obviously you know you're just speaking from such a, a, a sort of a, a depth of expertise and that really comes across so i mean that that hopefully wouldn't take as much time to brush up on this particular subject um but um i don't know i've got a few points to raise questions oh we've got somebody coming in all oh, right hello just at the end after the talk <laughs> oh well um yeah uh hey caroline um so, I mean, I'll hold off. Did, did um, anybody else have any questions or any points they wanted to raise? Ali, go for it. Is that it? Yeah. Um, one point that came up right at the end there, which uh, kind of queued up something I'd been thinking about asking you anyway, Martin, uh, for your guidance and wisdom. Um, the you mentioned the equality diversity and inclusion agendas which all councils have uh now first of all i i, I not so much in a men's health context but in various other uh the political and community and uh, uh active citizenship uh uh hats on i've had a lot of engagement with councils and completely endorse in my experience everything you've said is like really really good advice um, my concern with the men's health agenda, though, is kind of at a higher level. Uh, one of the things we see, I've seen in Manchester personally, but I know it comes up in a lot of places, is that uh, funds, including for public health and community health, uh, which are delivered through or 
with uh, with re recognition of the equality and diversity and inclusion uh, angles will specify priorities of BAME people, uh, women, disabled people, um, LGBT people, uh, and one or two others that I may have, have missed here. But the, the effect is, what they are saying is we will prioritize absolutely everything except men. Yeah. Um, and this is something, they don't even know they're doing it. They, they think they're being helpful and inclusive and, and addressing inequalities. But actually what they're doing is they're actively excluding the people who are, are in, in this particular respect, already the most excluded um, and the most marginalized. Um, and one of the things we at, at the coalition, we would really appreciate help with is finding ways of getting all authorities, but you know, local authorities are a very good example of it, um, persuading them to, to see beyond this kind of agenda and actually understand that what they are doing is embedding institutional discrimination against one of their most vulnerable sections of their population. Uh, do, do you first of all recognize that and, and have you got any suggestions about how we begin to change this? Yeah, I, 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 there's a few thoughts and, and I, I, there's an argument as to how successful it's been. One is, don't, don't, my general thing is don't fight it. I mean, if people, you know, if you start saying actually it's not women, you're dead. I mean, that's it, you're dead. You know, just the door closes and you might as well stop. Um, so I do think there is a, uh, and that's because, you know, let's be absolutely straight, there is still an awful lot that needs to be done to uh, to tackle the inequalities faced by women. And there's no doubt in that. There's, you know, there's, there's a whole lot of disadvantages that women face that men don't face, and in some areas vice versa. Um, but, you know, the idea of saying that there's no agenda left to be done, you're not going to win that argument. So don't try and win it. Um, the approach that we've tended to try and take, where at least the conversation is happening, is uh, to be positive. So, for example, we always, and we you know, genuinely believe it's the case, think it's great that there's going to be a women's health strategy. It has highlighted a whole bunch of new issues in a way that needs to be highlighted, and we're absolutely confident that if the men's health strategy happens, it will do the same for men. Um, we do generally try and take a, uh, an, a kind of intersectional approach. So if people are saying uh, we need to do things in the BME community, we would go, we completely agree. Here's some stuff on BME men, prostate cancer, cardiovascular disease, blood pressure that you need to be thinking about as part of your program for BME men. So you're not saying we want men as a category, but you are asking for a male lens on the work that's going on. Uh, and, you know, there is the same case can be made for disabled men. Um, uh, homelessness is an area where inevitably people start looking at the needs of men. Um, uh, and also, if you get issues that are important to men and to women, but where there is a need, where inevitably you will end up with a focus on men like suicide is, is you know, a, is always an example, sadly. Um, then, then that is a way in as well. So I think there's a couple of things. One is if there is some kind of institution that you can be a part of or that there's a local organization can be a part of, then it may well be that even though the priority is written down as women, you can get a voice at the table and sort of be in the room and raise issues when they come up in, a, in, a, in an appropriate way. Um, and I think go with the other inequalities that people are looking at and look for a male lens on those. And, and, I, and I suppose, yes, and try and get in the room because it may be difficult. It may be very difficult to get the, the headline approach um, changed. But paradoxically, that doesn't mean you won't necessarily be able to get action. This is also an area where there's a lot of, I mean, councillors and other such people just don't know what the situation is. So that on the basis, you, particularly in politics, you should never ask a question that you don't know the answer to. Um, you know, there are opportunities, if you find your friendly councillor, to ask questions like, you know, what proportion of NHS health checks are conducted by this authority are amongst men? 
or what's the gender split? Don't even do it more neutral than that. Um, so get questions out there, um, either through counsellors or through public questions. And if you need the, the evidence before you start that process, then through freedom of information. So there, there can just be a bit of awareness raising. And, and, and also even just awareness raising in the media can feed back into councils. You know, if, 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 um, if I know anything about local councillors, they're all pretty obsessed with their local newspaper. And, um, you know, that's putting it mildly. Um, and their local radio and their local media. So if you can get stories in there that are highlighting issues and things that need to be challenged, then believe me, they w it will go back into the council and people will be talking about it and thinking, oh, hang on, what's this? We better get ahead of it. So, um, yeah, that would, that would be my sort of main thought, which is probably fighting a high level battle is a hard thing in that particular case but there are ways to make sure that the needs of the most disadvantaged men are properly taken into account and, and I think that is the appropriate that is what councils are interested in generally you know they're they're not um there's a general feeling shall we say that the prosperous male middle classes can probably look after themselves when councils are deciding what they want to do with their um, their funding and their activity so if you if you uh, I mean I, I think this is something we should be doing as a sort of men's health movement anyway which is thinking about the most disadvantaged men I mean it's one of the things I always say to try and connect with um people who are thinking through these terms is to say you know obviously male suicide a very big problem it's three times higher chance of dying from suicide amongst men as amongst women but let's not forget that a man doing a manual job on a on a building site is three times more likely to die from suicide as i am and making sure that you're tapping into the inequalities and other concerns that they have i think so it is this thing of take Take what they're saying and show how a focus on men within those areas will enable them to do a better job, I think would be my advice. I don't know if that helps. It does help, and there's some really positive things in there. I'm a little bit uh, uh, dispirited is probably the word, though, because over the last year, or about a year ago now, uh, we had a long engagement with an organisation called DEI, which was advising all the major trust uh, funding organizations in the country, you know, National Lottery, Children in Need, all of those, you know, just Roundtree Trust and all the rest of them. And they were developing a new uh, diversity and inclusion program, uh, which followed the exact pattern that I, uh, that I described, that basically included everyone. Everybody but men. Except men. Um, and we tried to engage with them in the exact way that you uh, that you've just suggested and, and kind of saying, you know, we, we totally support what we're trying to do here. Let's think of that we can particularly address the intersectionality. How do you deal, you know, how, how do you fund a project for um, uh, young male asylum seekers for yeah. example, um, without having their, uh, their gender as being a factor in that? Um, and they just completely blanked us. They refused to engage with it. What they came back with us is, oh, oh, well, okay, you make, you make an interesting point, but we'll consider men an interest group. Um, rather than a, 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 an identifying category, um, yeah, which was basically just a brush off. Said no, like no, we they were saying we are recommending that projects for women's health, including for the most vulnerable, marginalised, impoverished uh, uh, people, projects for women's health should be prioritised over projects for men's health, as uh, as, a, as a statement of policy. And that's what they are telling all the funders in the country, including local authority. Um, uh, um, distributed funds. Uh, so you know, well, there is. Yeah, you know, we kind of well, we are into, and it's, it, it, we, I mean, there are our hair, right? there are other tools in the toolkit. Okay, of so um, which I didn't talk about partly because they really irritate me when they happen, but they do work <laughs> sometimes. So um, there is there is judicial review. Okay, so that's serious money. Yeah. Um, but you know, if people are making if public bodies, it only applies to public decision making bodies, but if they are making unsound decisions that are not factually based or they're not doing a proper, you know, you need to get legal advice on these kind of things, 
uh, and not properly considering the equality duty. And the equality duty does not say favour women over men. It says you need to understand how different groups are affected. Um, so that is that is something which even in the uh, context of the men's health strategy, you know, we are keeping in our back pocket. We want to do it in a positive way, but there are more nuclear options. And I say this as somebody who's been at the receiving end of a judicial review. Um, <laughs> it, once you're into that kind of antagonistic space, I mean, people, you know, I can tell you now, councils will not mess about and they probably will not speak to you for quite a long time afterwards. Well, that, um, that, but, that's um, the problem with nuclear options, isn't it? Yeah, that is the problem you, with you, nuclear you options. You tend to burn your own bridges at the same time. So. Yeah. No, that's an interesting... I didn't know that that was happening because, yeah. because you know, the... the the uh, the health outcomes for men recently have really not been very good, and you know that we we suffered from a gender blind approach to COVID, which you know I think we can say if not thousands, tens of thousands more people died as a result of that. But anyway, we should probably move on to another question. But I will say we we, we have got a, a, a plan on the back burner that we should Dan really now we we should. Uh, Try to move this forward to get back in touch with the DEI and actually see if we can like open a negotiation specifically about how funders support men, um, and that would include local authorities. And, and you know, if we can help with that, then course, I'm sure we'd be interested in joining in. Uh, but you know, we're running out of time, so I'll pass on. To okay, you. no, Sorry. I mean, I, mean I, I, well, first of all, yes, Ali, absolutely, and totally agree with that. Um, and in terms of running, I mean, I feel like that question opened up a really rich seam of thought and, and information so it's fine <laughs> we martin's martin's here to tell us what's going on in his brain so that's that's great um so uh is it, i've got a couple of questions but uh elvira caroline do you have anything you wanted to to mention no i don't have anything okay great hey caroline um i uh, i joined a bit late really to um uh, anything i might ask my <laughs> might have already been covered so i'm gonna to have to watch the talk back i think but oh, okay. interested in the discussion anyway well i mean from you from i mean your work with um is there anything sort of insights working with you know men's men's health from your perspective that that you might be interested in adding or um i suppose from my side of things i haven't had an issue so far in getting funding for for work with men's health um Part of that, uh, it might be because I've been looking at conditions that affect more women than men. So there's the argument that everything, all kind of care has been tailored to um, to suit what works for women. So then we've got that argument of no one's really addressed men before. Um, um, I guess it's for me it's come to making justifications on an individual basis based on the project the sort of making that justification of why um why men should be the specific focus um and kind of um uh, i guess uh, tailoring that to the funders particular um areas but but then i haven't had to deal with these big um like the big dei type um across sort of uh, large national well they're national funders but but not across um uh, i think i suppose the other thing is often within health specific health conditions um medics often are very aware of this um disadvantage that medics are often worried about how do we deal with men um so mm. my last grant that focused on men um <clears throat> men are dying at twice the rate of women of that specific condition so all of the um letters of support i got from medics were saying we get a heart thing as soon as a man walks in and we diagnose him and um so some of that probably goes a long way in helping um having that sort of uh that clinician backing I think and you raise a really important point there, which is often people on the front line and practitioners in councils, I mean, we're in the lens of councils, you know, they know often, they may not always know, but, but, but often I think that kind of understanding where people are coming from and asking if they've seen anything that happens that relates, relates particularly to men, you know, is just a, is a good way in. That, that's if you're dealing, for example, if you're dealing with public health professionals, I mean, they'll generally know they're all over the data. Um, and so, so I think, I think that point of, 
just understanding where the professionals are coming from as well can be a really good way in. You do run into, I mean, I certainly found this in terms of what we found after a while in terms of engaging with the Department of Health and Social Care and Public Health England when it still existed is that often the, the policy make, the, the front end civil servants knew about the situation, knew the disadvantage faced by men. And in that particular case, the issue was that they didn't really have political cover sometimes to make the changes that were needed. So which was why we needed to move upstream and we're working with Dan and others on a men's health strategy is to get that political cover to do things that people further down the organization know they need to happen. In some ways, councils I think are more informal than that. And the, and the journey, the distance between the policymaker and implementation is much shorter and so if you can have those conversations and build those relationships and get somebody on side, often you'll find that the counsellor will be the person thinking, I'm wondering how I can get this through the system, uh, which, which may help with that journey. Um, but it, but it, you may, you, I, think, I think the point there, which is, you know, even if the high level policy might not always be helpful, you can find people inside the system who understand the issue and, and tapping into that and tapping into their goodwill or are interested in the issue is, is you know, is the start point of any kind of influencing operation. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, they, I know that it's something that Mark, um, uh, uh, I'm sure everybody here, maybe Elvira does know, our colleague Mark talks about in the domestic abuse sector that um, often practitioners on the ground really a very different perspective than the policy makers um and it's due it's that thing isn't it if you're working on the ground often you have you kind of see what the facts are and you that's what's driving your decisions and your perspectives and, and um, if, you, if if as an outside campaigner you can kind of use that to leverage up into the organization and, and help drive policy change that could be quite powerful i mean people like you know politicians like anybody else they like case studies they like real examples that they can understand that's often easier to understand than a bunch of statistics um, you know, so if you if you do go along and see somebody, having the voice of somebody with real experience of the problem that you might be talking about can be very, very impactful. Well, that's a good segue. I mean, one of the questions I was going to raise, which you sort of answered, was, you know, as a former journalist, you know, what, what, what and, and with a view on the death of local newspapers, how much impact does local reporting have? But it sounds like it, it's it is it is an important sort of tool. I think, in the I think, <laughs> I think it varies. I mean, yeah. you know, I think in a lot of places, newspapers are relatively dead. There are still a lot of very dedicated local journalists, tiny numbers of them producing, you know, a lot of local news. I think they work differently now. So what I've, I mean, this is almost like the theory of how local government works. So, um, so people buying the newspaper on a daily or weekly basis is, is a smaller factor than it was. I mean, it's a much smaller factor than it was. The web story appearing in, I mean, we have this web page on Facebook called Winchester Rants, where people just rant about stuff. And, you know, something will appear in the Chronicle. Somebody will post it and then they'll just be like a 50 person thread, you know, slagging me off <laughs> or somebody. Oh, great. And next door and things like councillors are all a bit obsessed by next door as well, because, you know, you've got a ward. It's a fairly defined area. What are they talking about? So I think local local journalism has changed, but it it is it does find its way through. I think it's still quite it, it does depend on it by area. I mean, I'm very aware of that, but it is still, I think, an important intermediator for how what what people talk about in an area even if it hasn't come because somebody's picked up a newspaper and read it it might have come because they saw a an article from the website on the facebook they've never even been to the web page or they you know or they saw it next door or or whatsapp or whatever whatever how it is however the connection and communication is going on i suppose yeah with the with the uh, you know the kind of the plus side to you know i suppose the death of local newspapers is partly as a result of the internet I suppose the, the other side of that is um, the kind of the power that Facebook groups and online campaigns have for people who wouldn't have access to, you know, getting their, paper, their story in the newspaper. So I suppose there's a bit of swings and roundabouts to that as well. Um, one, one question, I, I another question I had for you is, um, you talked about uh, the, the scrutinies. Is there, uh, is there kind of a, if you like, um, a, a line or a position or a, section within strategic a strategic document that you should try and get 
men's health written into if you see what i mean is there somewhere that you should have it written down within within the the kind of the articles of whatever the appropriate i think term. i think that i mean the high level strategies tend to be quite high level and there will be budget so you know if you, the, the theory is you have your high level strategy then the budget comes forward that lays out what's going to be spent in the different areas it's not in like super detail it's normally about making sure you set the council tax at the right level and then one of the big building blocks of the budget unfortunately in today's world a lot of that's then cuts and things like that um uh and and so you can go into the world of reading council papers to try and understand what's going on um scrutiny slight and then there's a generally a sort of flow of council papers through the system that are coming on their way towards cabinet or full council or wherever it might end up full council is when all the councillors meet together um the in terms of sort of getting an issue on the table that's almost i think at the end of the process you might you know it is worth when you're mapping who you need to talk to it is worth saying right this is the cabinet member who's in charge of adult social care because they're the person who's probably in charge of the budget that relates to me or housing or whatever it might be but it's also worth knowing who's the chair of the scrutiny committee who are the opposition spokespeople on the scrutiny committee that looks at this particular area of work because because it's quite an investment to start understanding the details of how councils work and how they set their policies and it that is i think one of the areas where the sooner you can find a friendly counselor who can help you navigate it because i suspect it also varies a bit by council where you would find that kind of thing um, and who you would need to influence so uh, it is one of those things where probably the sooner you can find a guide to help you through it um the better you will be and it yeah that that would be my thought Any other questions from from anyone? I think that was Robin. Any thoughts that come to mind? Hi, you've gone a bit quiet there, Dan. Yeah, Sorry, I just, want, just wanted to see. Did, can you hear me now? Okay. I yeah. can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah right. <laughs> uh, I, I, you've talked a lot about um, organisations influencing councillors. How can individuals do that? Is there any particular advantage to being an individual trying to swim? against the river no I, th I think it can be actually i mean you know there's nothing that annoys any politician more than kind of loads of standard emails and things like that it's all a bit wearing um you know you want to hear individual voices you want to hear people's individual experiences and you know and, and there's a kind of almost a start point aside from any policy change you know, if you've got a problem that you think the council should be helping you with then it is worth talking to your local council council law you know you can go straight into the system uh but they often will be able to navigate chivy you know help you along and they will want to i would hope help you with any individual issue that you bring to them um no absolutely individuals can make change because often also councillors are looking for ideas of things they might want to do next campaigns that they might want to run and so if you bring them something they're often you know sometimes they'll get the bit between their teeth as an individual and work with you to try and get change on things. I can think of lots of things that have happened which have started with not an organization getting in touch, but with an individual getting in touch and saying, this is what matters to me. You know, can you help? This is something I'd like to do. So absolutely, I think that's a good starting point. I think if you're at the scale of trying to get a sort of tectonic shift in terms of what a council is doing, at that point, you probably need an organization because you need to be reaching across lots of councillors. But if you're into the kind of pushing to make something better, then absolutely an individual can do things an individual can turn up and make a deputation they can talk about their life experience they can ask questions all of that list of things that i talked about earlier was actually written originally with the idea of an individual can do that um you, an individual can write a freedom of information request an individual can run for the council although i would stress it's not completely straightforward winning an election but it's quite entertaining if you try to decide to do it that's fantastic. I think, well, we're, we're, we're literally at the hour now, and I can't think of a better place to end, um, to be honest with you. So, um, yeah, thank you very much again, Martin, for uh, joining us and all of your fascinating insights and expertise. Thank you, everybody, for being here. And um, please keep coming to our NBC Friday sessions. Have a nice weekend. Bye-bye for now. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, thank you for thank inviting you. me. Cheers. Cheers. Martin. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.